All right, this is what I call the brief jog through photo history. I've broken this into three parts. So this will be part one. And part one will be sort of about um, the technology and the processes that make up photo history. Part two will be about some of the uh, main players, uh, phot photographers in history and, and their influence on the medium. And the third part will be about photo manipulation. So we'll start off with this process and technology. Like I say, it's the briefest of versions. I call it a quick jog through photo history. So here we go. It kind of starts off in the 5th, 4th century BC with something called the camera obscura. And artists use these all the time in order to uh, see an image projected into a dark room that they could trace and or paint directly uh, from the projection. So camera obscura literally means dark room, and it is just a darkened room with a hole in it that projects the image in. So we fast forward to 1826 and Joseph Niepce, a French chemist, inventor, we'll call him a photographer, creates a camera obscura out of his room in France, and this is the view from it. And he figures out a way to coat a piece of tin with tar. And this tar hardens or changes its structure when it's exposed to daylight. And so he hangs this piece of tin in this room that's a camera obscura and exposes it for eight plus hours and ends up with this, what we call the first photograph. And by photograph, we mean something that is affixed to a substrate and rendered using light, right? So light is what's done this. He didn't draw this, he didn't trace this. Light has made this image appear on this substrate. So he's working on this and there's another guy named Louis Daguerre who's working on a process that ends up being called the daguerreotype, which doesn't use tin and asphalt, but it uses glass plates with some, some silver on them and a process of giving, putting uh, iodine vapors on it and then exposing it and then putting mercury vapors on it. So a little bit toxic, a little different kind of approach, but a little bit more practical in a sense. And I know it doesn't sound too practical to carry around iodine, glass plates, and mercury, but it was more practical than Niepce's project. And there's some speculation that the two of them were working together. I think it's pretty obvious the two of them were working together, but the speculation really comes into the fact that they were probably stealing ideas and or secrets from each other throughout this process. But Louis Daguerre sort of ended up the victor and the daguerreotype became the first really practical process, photographic process that was sort of accessible to everybody. And this is a daguerreotype. This particular one from 1839 represents the first time that a person was photographed in a shot. And you can see that person standing there getting their shoes shined. This exposure was probably about 10 minutes long, and that person stood there for most of that time. There are other people and buggies and horses and everything going on on the streets of Paris here. But with that 10 minute exposure, they all get so blurred away that they just disappear. We don't even, they don't even register on the daguerreotype. These photos were taken with a very large camera. You can see here's a, an example of that large camera. And this photographer is taking a portrait of somebody. You can also see that, that stand behind their head with that arm that sticks out and kind of holds their head in place because with these long exposures, the person would have to sit still for a long time. There are some portraits, daguerreotype portraits, where the eyes look kind of cloudy and hazy, and that's because of the long exposure and the blinking during that exposure. Around this same time, there are a couple of English inventors, photographers, that are trying out some other processes. So this is John Herschel, and he's trying out a, a glass negative type of photography. And the glass negative is kind of new and inventive because the daguerreotype is a one-off. You take that one picture, it gets turned into a positive by being exposed to the mercury and then, and then mounted against a piece of black velvet. But with John Herschel, he's creating these glass negatives that can be printed, that can be used to make more copies of the same image. And around this same time, 
Henry Fox Talbot is working on something that he calls the calotype, which is a paper negative. And here you can see the paper negative in the upper left and the print from it in the lower right. So these guys are all working on this at the same time. From this point on, there is sort of a, a revolving door of processes that come through. Wet plate collodions, tin types, um, other glass plate negatives, all kinds of things just start kind of coming in. And people are, are thinking of and devising new ways and new substrates and structures to make photographs happen. And so we're going to kind of jump uh, quite a ways forward to 1884, where this guy, George Eastman, invents a, a flexible substrate film to put the photosensitive coating on top of. And so in 1884, he, he invents film, which gets used in those same kind of cameras that the daguerreotypes was using, were using, uh, but it's a nice flexible medium. In other words, you're not carrying around tin or metal or glass or something that is as delicate as paper. You can carry around this film, this piece of film that comes. And so after inventing film, he then figures out how to put it into a roll format and invents the Brownie camera in about 1900. And that's this box in the lower right. And the Brownie camera was really interesting because it came loaded with 50 photos and you would take all those photos and then send it back to Kodak and they would unload it, process the film, make your prints, reload the camera and send it all back to you. In other words, this made photography completely accessible to the masses. And that really kind of opened the door for how can we make this even more accessible. And so around 1925, a German optical engineer and a mechanic and an industrial designer, we'll call him a photographer again, you can see how this sort of industry and science is all colliding together and it's creating this photography. His name is Oscar Barnack, and he invents the 35 millimeter camera. Now, there were other things that were kind of happening around this, but he was the first one to really miniaturize and commercially create or make it commercially accept, uh, viable, uh, the 35 millimeter camera, and it was the Leica cameras. You may have heard of Leica cameras. Um, they're still around. They're a very top, high-end quality camera. So he develops this 35 millimeter camera. That sort of makes it hand holdable. It's all in your hand and reloadable by the consumer themselves instead of having to send it to Kodak. So Kodak starts creating new films in order to meet the demands that are happening in the world. And so in 1935, they come up with this process called Kodachrome. And Kodachrome is a color reversal film. It shoots a color positive image. It's a slide. Invented in 1935, really sort of the first successful color material that is created for photography. And it's used for cinematography. It's used for still photography. Um, it was used for a number of years. It was discontinued in 2009 and the process was discontinued in 2010. So it was around for quite some time. As this medium all sort of came of age, uh, this camera came out and this is called the Kine Ectera, or Ectra, Ecta, and it's uh, the first single lens reflex camera. And by single lens reflex camera, what it means is you look into the camera and you're looking at a mirror that goes out the same lens that the camera uses. In the first Leica, it was a rangefinder camera. You looked through a little window that gave you an approximation of what you saw. But this one, the top of this, where that button is on the very center of the top, flips open and you have a waist level finder. You can look down into the top of the camera and see by way of a mirror right out through the exact lens that's going to photograph your image. So this SLR camera sort of brought about where we are now, which is the digital SLR camera, single lens reflex, DSLR. Single lens reflex meaning we're looking through the lens of the camera, the actual lens that's going to take the image. And the reflex is that there's a mirror that has to flop up and back down as we take that picture. So from this point forward, there's a lot of advances in design of cameras, 
usability of cameras. And as far as the films go, there's a lot of advancement in film in different kinds of color films, different speeds of film, better grain of film, smaller grain, tighter grain. It's a lot of sort of um, incremental improvements over the years. We're going to take another big leap forward to 1975 when, a, when an, uh, an engineer at Eastman Kodak designs and develops this first digital camera. So 1975, this digital camera is created. It weighed about eight pounds and it took a one one hundredth of a megapixel image, about 129 pixels square. Think of that as the size of your profile picture in the Instagram app on your phone. That's how big this thing shot. So it would take the picture and it would record it onto the memory, the built-in memory that you see in that framework below the blue box of the camera. And then he had to come up with a way to sort of fix it into memory semi-permanently or more permanently. And that storage medium that he chose was a cassette tape. So you see where it says digital on the side, that's a cassette tape that would record the image onto the tape. It took about 23 seconds for it to record that 0.01 megapixel image. And he would allow, he, he designed it to allow 30 images to be recorded on each tape. And he chose 30, not because of how much space the tape had, but because it sort of fit in between the 24 or 36 exposures that you would get on a normal roll of film. So he kind of split the difference on that. And then you would take that tape and you would plug it into the reader on the microcomputer and it would load it into the microcomputer's memory and then the microcomputer could display it on the TV screen. This was the beginning of the digital photography revolution. And um, Sasson said that he was assuming Moore's law and he determined that it would be about 15 to 20 years before these cameras would really be viable and be readily accessible to everybody. And he was almost dead on because that would have put it at about 1995. And that's when the first sort of digital cameras just started sort of slipping out. I think it was really kind of later in the 90s that they became really, really accessible to uh, the consumer. And we're going to kind of jump forward again. So as they become accessible to the consumer, then the technology starts to get better. So you can kind of see that there's these landmark moments and then incremental change that sort of takes us to the next level. And really that next level in photography as we know it today would be the digital SLR camera. You can throw in micro four thirds or mirrorless cameras. They all work in a very similar way, which is that there is a large sensor behind this lens that with an SLR, there's a mirror that flops up and a shutter that opens. With a mirrorless, there is no mirror. It's all electronic and there's a shutter that opens. And with a micro four thirds, it's similar to a mirrorless, just a slightly different format. But this EOS 1DS uh, was the first digital SLR with a full frame sensor. And by full frame sensor, I mean the same size as a piece of 35 millimeter film, which meant that professional photographers could use this camera just like they used their other cameras that they had been using. The lenses acted the same. The image was captured in the same format. Everything about it was just the way that all other photos had been taken up until then with the exception of being digital. So this camera was eight megapixels, this first full frame DSLR that came out. It came out in 2002 and it cost $8,000 without a lens. It came with the body and a memory card and the battery. And you could then go out and take pictures. It was a turning point in digital photography because it sort of opened everything up and allowed us to um, sort of move on as we had before. 